Take your Bible, if you would. I want you to find two scriptures for the beginning of our message tonight. Matthew 28. And when you find Matthew 28, would you then find Acts chapter 1, and we'll take verse 8 out of there as our launching off place. But uh, if you've ever been involved in a sword drill, you're going to feel like you've been in a sword drill tonight. But I do want to look, examine a number of scriptures to discover this in our message tonight, God's plan for missions. I don't want to sound like an old man, but I am one, and so I probably will. But one of the things I'm a little bit distressed by today is what I perceive as the sense in some of the younger men that if it's not new, it's not effective. It's got to be new. We're looking for something new. And I would suggest to you that in this 21st century, might, what we might want to be very careful about is doing what God instituted in the first century. I don't think we need a new plan to reach the world. I think we need a new determination to reach the world. But what I hope to do tonight in these few moments is expose to you a couple of things. Number one, how did God tell us to go about reaching the world? And let me encourage you, you go to a church that is using God's first century plan. Maybe we can give some reassurance in that. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 28, very familiar verses, one of the places where the Lord gives us the great commission. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord has called himself, or called to himself, the disciples. And these 11 disciples have met him in a place that he appointed. We're assuming on a hillside in this moment. And he is going to give them what we call the Great Commission. Now, I want to be very careful to note something here. He is not talking to them as 11 individuals alone. If the Great Commission were given to these men as 11 individuals, on their death, the Great Commission expired. No, what they represent is the local church. And it is the local church that is commissioned to be the instrument, the tool in God's hand to reach the world with the gospel. And as members of a local church, we too are to involve ourselves in being busy in that plan that our church has to reach the world. He gives them three very clear commands. He says, first of all, go ye therefore, and the number one command, teach all nations. I don't have time to exactly develop this passage as it could be developed, but I, I want you to know I'm going to draw attention to some Greek words tonight. Now please understand, 49 years ago I took a full year of elementary Greek, I am a scholar. I am not a scholar, but I love the study of words. I own a Strong's Concordance, and it makes me dangerous, all right? We know that when Jesus says teach, he is using the word mathetuo, and what he is saying is make disciples. You and I know how to make disciples. You take the gospel to them. You present to them that they are sinners, that Jesus is the remedy for that sin provided by God, and by their confessing their need of Him, confessing their sinfulness and calling on Him, they can be saved. And every one of us who is a believer in this room tonight is to be busy in making disciples, sharing the gospel with men and women and seeing them saved. He gives a second command. 
after you have shared the gospel and seen them saved, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Baptism is very simply a public profession of the fact of having trusted Jesus Christ. That's an inner work in the heart of a man. But God wants us to be very public about our faith and public about being saved. And so he gives us the mode of showing that by being dipped over, if you will, in water. We show the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we publicly identify ourselves with the gospel. Now I'll say this, being baptized today it may bring a little bit of embarrassment. We're, we're sometimes shy people. But to be honest with you, it's, it's no big deal to get baptized in our culture. But I do want you to know in this day and in other cultures, being baptized is a very big deal. It may well have costed these men their lives. It may have cost them their relationship with their family. It may have cost them their business. And there are places and cultures where that is still true today. But the Lord considers it to be important and it is part of the commission. Make disciples, baptize those disciples. And then very clearly, he says, teach them to observe all things uh, whatsoever I have commanded you. A couple of simple thoughts. I am, uh, have been saved now for a long time, got saved back in 1975. I don't know about you, but I do know about me. I'm not there yet. I'm still learning. God is still working on me. God is still growing me. And what I have found is that to observe all the things that he has commanded me in all the seasons and circumstances that life will bring me takes a lifetime. And I would suggest to you, it takes a church. And I really believe that we ought to be church planting missionaries or at least have that as the goal in all of our work. And so what I believe the Lord is saying is, in a church, in an assembly of those believers that you have seen saved, baptized, then for a lifetime teach them to be followers of me and teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you and then to obey, to observe in their life. Wow, that's a big work. But let me add something to it. Not only is it big in the work that is to be done, it is enormous in the area it's to occur. Move up to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both. Such a simple word with such a profound meaning. Understand that when we read that word both, the Lord is saying to us at the same time. We are to be witnesses at the same time in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I don't know about you again, but I'm fairly wide, but I can only occupy one space at one time. And so a question presents itself to me, if I can only occupy one place at one time, how does the Lord command me to make disciples, see them baptized, see them discipled, and I'm to do that in my hometown, Jerusalem. I'm to do that in the near environs of Judea. I'm to go to the little bit further environs of Samaria. And oh, by the way, I'm to be doing that at the same time unto the uttermost part of the earth. Earth. Has God given us a commission that is impossible to accomplish? Has God given us a command that we cannot obey? And I'm here to tell you tonight that the resounding wonderful answer is no. 
God knew that it was a difficult calling. God knew that it was a difficult task. But all through the rest of the New Testament, God will outline to us, here's how you do it. Let me give you the example of missions as God reveals it to us. It really boils down to our understanding one Greek word. Now, if you take this Greek word I'm about to reveal to you, add $10 to it, you can get a small coffee at Starbucks. The Greek word is propimpo. If we were going to anglicize it, we would spell it P-R-O-P-E-M. P-O. Isn't that awesome? What does it mean? Well, Mr. Strong tells us that it is used nine times in the New Testament, and it's translated in some very specific ways. It's translated brought, B-R-O-U-G-H-T, being brought, bring forth, accompanied, supported, conducted. Mr. Thayer, who is a Greek scholar, tells us that the literal meaning of it is to outfit for a journey. The thought of propimpo is, is to bring this something from here over to here. Now, it is used in the New Testament in three very clear ways. Number one, God says we are to propimpo in the sense of financial support. Number two, God says we are to outfit for the journey very clearly through prayerfully supporting who we financially send. And number three, God says there is a ministry that you are to have to those that you send in an emotional way, in, a, in an encouragement way of sustaining them on that field. I want you to notice that with me tonight. Here comes the sword conference. I mean, sorry, the sword drill. The sword conference. That's, that's good too. Uh, Acts chapter 15, would you? Now stay with me as we try to develop this, and I think when you see it, you'll understand and appreciate what God has revealed to us. Acts chapter 15 to begin with, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined, the they there is the church at Antioch, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way, there's our word, being brought, being propimpoed on our way, on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Let's unpack it. We'll take a minute. I'm talking fast. Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, and they are seeing Gentiles saved. I mean, it is an evangelistic meeting that has been nearly unparalleled. And anywhere that God is working, you can pretty well mark it down. It won't be long before the devil sends his crowd there just to try to be a hindrance. And sure enough, they hear from up in Jerusalem that there's a great evangelistic meeting going on. Gentiles are being saved. And not long after, here come the Judaizers. And when the Judaizers get there... Those who believe the law and want the law to be the source of salvation, which it never can be, they come down and they start talking to the converts made by the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And they say to them, hey, this message that Barnabas and Paul are preaching to you, woo what a great message, Jesus and listen, we love Jesus like they love Jesus. Isn't it amazing that the ones that are against us always think they're like us and say they are? We love Jesus like they do, but listen, Jesus is not enough. No, no, 
You have to add to Jesus adherence to the law. If you wanted to get under Paul's skin, tell somebody Jesus isn't enough. And they come back to the church at Antioch and they say to the church at Antioch, we have had enough with these Judaizers. We have got to get answers. We've got to settle this. Remember, we're very early in the New Testament now. And so the church at Antioch makes a decision. Hey, we are going to get an answer to this. Paul, Barnabas, one or two others, we want you to go up to Jerusalem, sit down with Peter, sit down with James, sit down with John, and let's get answers. Is it Jesus and Jesus alone, or do we have to add stuff to it? And so the church elders say, listen, since we can't all go, we can't all leave our businesses. We can't all leave our families. Since we're asking you to go in our place, let us, I don't know, let us deputize you to go in our place. Now let me stop and say, did you know that's exactly what we're doing with these missionaries here today? We can't all go to Zambia, can't all go to Senegal, can't all go to Chile and the other places that they're going, but God has commissioned us. God has commissioned Cleveland Baptist Church to preach the gospel and baptize converts and, and to disciple those converts in every place across this globe. And so what he does is he calls precious people to go and then we deputize them to go in our place. These missionaries, I've heard it four or five times, they're here on deputation. Well, what's the model? Since we're going to send you to Jerusalem, it's only right that we brought you on your way. That is horrible English. It is fabulous preaching. It's only fair that we outfit you for the journey. You're going on our behalf. You're going to get the answer for us. Therefore, we will propimpo you so that you're able to go. What did that mean in the first century? I, I don't know exactly. Maybe it meant script in Paul's pocket so that if they had to stay at an inn or so if they had to buy supplies on the way, maybe it meant some uh, sweet lady made a robe for Barnabas because his was wearing out in those cold nights on the road. He was going to need a cloak. Maybe somebody looked at, at, at Paul's sandals and they needed to be repaired. But that church took it upon themselves to provide for them what was necessary for that journey. And it boiled down to a financial cost. And can I say, though we are hesitant in our circles often to talk about finances and money. What I love about the missions conference is this, that none of the money we discuss stays here. It doesn't buy songbooks. It doesn't pay salaries. It doesn't turn the lights on, which are all valid expenses to be cared for by our tithes. But it has an outward look. It is deputizing those to go where it is our responsibility to preach and making sure that they're able to get there. Amen. Let me show you. Another place in the New Testament, turn up with me to the book of Romans, the book of Romans in chapter 15, in verse 22, I want you to notice this, Romans 15 in verse 22, Paul is speaking, he says, for which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought, there's our word, propimpo, to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if at first I be somewhat filled with your company." Again, a moment to unpack it. Paul is ministering in an area. He believes that God has laid it on his heart 
to go to Spain because nobody's preaching the gospel in Spain. And he writes a letter to the Roman church and he says, I'm just about done here. I'm going to go to Spain and where I'm at and where I'm going, you are in between. And I've desired to come and see what God is doing in the church at Rome. I've desired to meet you personally. There's some things I'd love to teach you, and I'm sure you can teach me some things. But then right in the middle of that, I want you to see what Paul does. Notice it again in verse 24. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey. <gasps> And to be brought on my way thitherward by you. Do you know what Paul just did? You ready? He asked for money. He asked for support. You and I that are men in this room know something about our manly hearts. We don't want to ask anybody for anything. We want to be self-sustaining. We want to be independent. Can I tell you one of the hardest things that God places on the lives of these missionaries to come in and say, I need your help. Will you help us? Will you give to us? I've been around this a long time and I, I'm sure there are somewhere out there, but I have yet to re meet a rich missionary. I hear these people every once in a while say, well, you know, they're missionaries. They're, they've always got their hair there. They're making a lot of money. Want to trade places with them? They're not rich people. They're cold people. They're dedicated people. They're determined people. My goodness, if you'll ask a woman to marry you five times, how determined are you? <laughs> they just want to get where God wants them to get. And God gives us the incredible blessing of being able to help them on their way, to deputize them and send them where He wants them to go. And our responsibility is to preach. That's what this missions conference is about. I hear all the time, well, I think we ought to get rid of deputation. Don't get rid of it. It's the model God set in the New Testament. Amen. I know it's a difficult thing. I know it takes years. I know it's hard to travel. But I'm telling you, I can show you I don't have time. I could take you to other places where Paul not only asks for support for himself, but for Timothy. It is the model that God has given us to go from church to church and seek support to preach the gospel where God has called you and God has made us responsible to make sure that someone preaches the gospel. Amen. Now let me say this and say it quickly. If a dollar bill solved all the problems of the world, we'd have solved it long ago. And sometimes one of the great failures in churches like ours and lives like ours is that we think our responsibility towards missions ends when we drop our check in the plate. And I want you to know, church, that just as that missionary is called to a lifetime of service preaching the gospel in that place that we cannot go, we are called for our lifetimes, not only to be givers, but to be those who sustain those people on those places. Here's what I'm saying. A dollar bill has never saved a soul. A dollar bill has never pulled the scales off of blinded eyes. A dollar bill has never opened a hardened heart. Only God and only us by praying and beseeching God to do that work will the gospel ever reach these people in these places? I want you to notice with me, up in the, or back in the book of Acts, go back with me to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, notice it in verse 1. 
And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard, set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand, sailed into Syria, landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. Finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, notice, and they all propimpoed us. They all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Oh, listen fast. The Apostle Paul, when you booked passage on a ship or on a boat in these days, it was not Princess Cruise Lines. When you booked passage on a ship, you found a cargo ship that was going the general direction you were going. It might mean that you'd have to stop three or four places before you got to where you were going, but you booked a place on the deck, if you were fortunate, a comfortable place under the, the, first, the top deck, and you got on that boat and you went where they went with their, uh, 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 their, their luggage and so on until it was uh, unloaded and loaded again and got you to your port. Well, Paul pays the fare. The, the ticket has been bought. And they go to this stop and that stop. And it was Paul's habit that when they would pull in and they were going to be days unloading and loading, he would either find a synagogue, if there was a synagogue, and begin to preach the gospel, or find a church, if there was a church, and begin to disciple those people. And in this town, there was a there was a church. And he goes to this church while they're loading and unloading the ship and they begin to share. And one of the elders in that church is deeply concerned about him going on to Jerusalem. Uh, this man knows that there's danger for Paul to go to Jerusalem to the point where he says, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go. Of course, the apostle Paul's mind was made up. And the Apostle Paul knew there were greater things to fear than problems in this life. And so when the call came from the captain of the ship, the ship is ready. You better come and get going. We're, we're headed for your port. Uh, that, that elder knew that he could not dissuade Paul from going. And so he, he gets all of the folks of the church and, and they gather around the Apostle Paul and there's no more ticket to be bought. There's no more money that is necessary. But I'll tell you what that elder knew. He knew that Paul's life had to be bathed in prayer. And they kneel down and they begin to pray for the Apostle Paul. Why are they praying for the Apostle Paul? Because they know full well he's going into danger. I have, I'm at the grandpa stage of life. And I see these young couples coming to our mission and they, they're seeking approval to be sent out. And, and I sit there as a grandpa and I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes I, I want to say back to them, man, that's, that's a hard place you're going. You sure? I got a granddaughter that's been to India and, and she, she says, Papa, I think God wants me to be a missionary to India. And I say right away to her, I say, well, no, I don't think so. I would never say that. My heart would want to say that. But I'm telling you, if we think putting a dollar or ten or a thousand in an offering plate, and then we're done. Hey, it's our finances that send these young families into these places. How dare we walk away and think that we have dispatched our responsibility by just giving the money to get them there. I'm telling you, our calling for all the days that we are alive and serving the Lord is to know their needs and know their condition, know their circumstances, calling out their names 
in prayer and calling out their needs in prayer, gathering around our table as families, having missions meetings among the men. We are to pray for these people. It's urgent. They face things. How does a guy go learn a language? Now, I know it can be done because God enables them, but I'm telling you, you and I need to pray for some of these guys. Have you ever read their application? They need help. How do you go into a culture that is so strange from anything you've ever known and you're able to walk in and sense and understand and move forward in that? I'm telling you, that is only done when God's Holy Spirit goes before you. How, how, do, you, how do you have influence with people that could care less about the message you bring only by the Spirit of God through prayer? And may God lay on churches like ours not only the burden to give, but the burden to pray, to pray with knowledge, to pray specifically. Getting these prayer letters and seeing what they say, seeing what they need, and not letting a week go by where we are not involved engaging the Spirit of God to help them through prayer. Very quickly, one last Drop back a chapter to Acts chapter 20. Notice with me in verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Paul speaking. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him. There's our word. They propimpoed him unto the ship. Very quickly, the ticket is bought. We saw them kneel down and pray together. The prayer is done. But when Paul is ready now to go down to that ship, the elder of that church, I believe, does something wonderful. The elder of that church says to the people, let's, let's walk down to the dock with him. They accompanied him. They, they propane put him down to the dock. And Now I'm getting into the book of Edwards, and I'm telling you I'm getting into the book of Edwards. But in my mind's eye, that elder holds that church there, and he says, let's just just wait here. The apostle goes down onto that dock and gets onto that little boat bobbing there in the harbor. And in my mind's eye, I see Paul at that rail holding on, and the elder's there, and and the ropes are cast off, and that little boat bobs out into the harbor and heads out to the open waters. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul's wondering when they're going to leave, but the elder says, no, the kids are getting a little right. No, no, no. And that boat goes into the Mediterranean, and it goes further and further out, and you can just barely make out Paul. He's still standing there at the rail. He's watching them watch him, and they're just watching him. You say, preacher, what is your point? I, I think, I wonder if that, those people stayed there until that boat dropped over the horizon, and I wonder if the message was this, we may never see your face again, but you will never be out of our heart. We will remember you. We will remember where we sent you. We will remember what you're doing there. We will care about your ministry. One of the things I've seen over the years working at the mission is this. One of the things that brings our missionaries home is a sense of isolation A sense of wondering, does anybody know I'm here? Does anybody care what we're going through? Does anybody even care? 
Oh, we have a big deal as pastors. Hey, you better send us a report. You better tell us what you're doing. You know what we're not so good about? Talking to them about what they're doing. My mom, my mom. Do not tell my wife I called her my mom. <laughs> Destroy this tape or whatever it is. My wife is the grandma's grandma, grandma. There is never a time that her child has a birthday or her grandchildren have a birthday where it's not a huge deal. There's a little mom on a mission field that can't even buy a box of brownie mix. Wonder what it would mean to her if 10 people, 10 ladies from Cleveland Baptist Church said, hey, I know it's Billy's birthday today. He's seven. Is he as wild as he was when he was in our conference? Don't say that. My wife, when our kids went off to college, she shut the door of their bedroom. She said, don't open it until I'm ready. I said, yes, ma'am. You know what those people do? They put their kids on an airplane and they fly a continent away. There's no coming home for Thanksgiving. They may not even be able to see each other at Christmas, maybe for a period of time over the summer, but you know, the fares are so expensive, maybe not. I'm not trying to feel sorry for them. I'm just trying to remind us that goodness gracious, ought not we in this world in which we live, when we can text anybody worldwide in a moment, when we can send an email into a home, when maybe some of us can get together and share the cost of a package, can't we at least let them know we know you're there? We pray for you. We love you. We love your children. That's part of sustaining them on the field. That's part of propimpoing them, helping them to be able to weather the difficult times, the lonely times. What do you do when that child is ill and grandma can't come and help? You get through it with the help of a ward. But how good it would be to know that somebody knows what you're going through, what you're facing. I'm done. But I'm just saying this to you. Church, God has called us to make disciples, baptize them, teach them to observe everything He's commanded us. He's called us to do it here in Cleveland. And man, is there a great need. And man, we ought to be busy. And I know this is a soul winning church. But at the same time, all the environs near us a little further and to the uttermost part of the earth. And then God works in the hearts of these wonderful families that are here. And he lays a burden and then he puts a responsibility of them to call us and to come and present a burden so that we can deputize them because God commissioned us to reach Chile. God laid it on our shoulders to reach Senegal and Zambia. God laid it on us and these dear sweet families will go if we will brought them there. And they will have effective ministries if we pray for them there. And they will get through the dark moments if we remember they are there. Where are you at on the spectrum? Why give to missions, preacher? You ever had a prayer letter at your table? Have you ever had a list and earnestly called out the name of that missionary and the need? Do you do it consistently? Have you ever taken a moment of your time and not just cared about your child's birthday or your grandchild's birthday or this care package to this college student? Have you ever thought, my goodness, there's a little family over in Zambia. And that little Eden, she ripped the prayer card out of my hand, but I'm not going to hold it against her. It's her birthday. I'm going to love her. 
and I'm going to let her mommy know I remember the lean. Church, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime for them, and it's a lifetime for us. And at the end of the day, this is what God said. This is how you do it. You give so they can go. You pray so that they can be effective. And you remember them. And you encourage them. And you sustain them for a lifetime.